So I am a child of the mid 80s and early 90s, and I'll give you a moment to do the math. And while I can recite pop songs with stunning accuracy, step by step by New Kids on the Block, no exception, perhaps no cultural fad was more appealing to me than this one. Assuming it works. You might have to do the clicking. This one. <laughs> Meet Tiptoe, the T.Y. Beanie Baby rat from the infamous cultural hype that many of you will likely remember. Growing up, I remember with great keenness my sister and I participating in this cultural craze. My sister, five years younger if you're still doing the math, gravitated towards the cute animals in the collection like pink kittens or purple puppies. And I, on the other hand, always went for the less desirable animals like mice or baboons, bats, and yes, rats, like my friend Tiptoe here on the screen. When questioned about my curious choice in Beanie Babies, I always said that the animals nobody wants or nobody cared for needed just as much love, if not more love, than the more popular choices. The value of, work, the, value of the work of outreach and social justice was instilled in me at a young age. Seemingly innately, I questioned wealth discrepancies and sought fair and good practices in all that I said and did. And while it's hard to pinpoint exactly where I developed an early interest in the least of these in beanie baby form or otherwise, my passion was fueled by a charismatic church leader who helped all congregation members, young and old, engage in the work of outreach and social justice. I also cannot deny how the influence of my denomination, the United Church of Canada, has impacted my worldview and keenness for outreach and social justice. In fact, I spent some time this fall tracing the United Church's views on social justice through articles of doctrines, creeds, and statements of faith. And this deep dive into the, theolo to the theology, theological statements of the United Church reinforced for me the Church's commitment to the practice of justice. And throughout this presentation, you'll find quotes from the United Church's Song of Faith that helps ground this project in the theology from which it arises. The early formative experiences I shared in my involvement with the United Church has driven much of my work in ministry to date and has helped inspire this graduate research project. Broadly stated, my research question for this project was, what are the internal dynamics of outward facing congregations? So these churches that have strong community connections that seem to serve others more than they serve themselves, these churches that eat, sleep, and breathe justice and focus on more on the outside than their own survival, that face outwards instead of inwards, what makes them tick? What drives such congregations? What are the rewards of this work, the challenges? What can be learned from their practice of ministry that might inform our own practice? But what exactly do I mean by social justice or outreach or outward facing? Because this research seeks to highlight the voices of participants, I'm going to let my participants speak. And I've put together a little video here and I asked them, what does the work of social justice mean to you? And these are some of the responses they gave.
My study was a grounded theory study, but because I was looking to glean insights into the experiences of these congregations, I also employed methods of phenomenology in my research. Through connection with my research advisor, Reverend Dr. Andy O'Neill, and consultation with Reverend Dr. Ross Bartlett, and through an appeal on social media, I was able to identify three congregations from across Canada who are leaders in social justice and outreach. I had 11 participants in my research from two denominations. The interviews were conducted in group settings in several formats. For the sake of maintaining confidentiality while presenting my data, I have renamed the churches who participated and all the individual participants. As you can see here on the slide, we have Atwood Fellowship Church with participants Anita, Annika, and Aaron, Boyden Memorial Church with participants Brian, Brandon, and Beverly, Cullohan Community Church with participants Claire, Christine, Catherine, and Kathy. And the more observant among you might notice that the first letter of the name of each participant is the same as the church letter name. It's very intentional. And the even more observant among you might notice that the church names are all Canadian literary icons. And if you know me at all, that's also very intentional. <laughs> Participants were asked 10 questions that attended to draw out stories of the work their congregation was engaging with, the challenges of doing this work, as well as their hopes and dreams. My overall goal for this research was to bring to light some of the work churches are doing so that others in church leadership might learn and adapt for their own practices and ministry. Through sharing with you today some of what I've learned, my hope is that we can become better equipped to live out our challenge and our calling as Christians to love and serve others as we ourselves would like to be loved and served. And I want to start by simply sharing with you the breadth of the ministries of the folks I interviewed engaged in. Broadly put, there are four main categories that the ministries of those interviews interviewed can be placed into. There were food ministries, defined as the work that focuses on feeding the hungry or addressing food insecurity. Ministries of community support, defined here as the work that focuses on creating healthy communities. Advocacy, defined as work that focuses on lifting up and creating spaces for voices on the margins. And personal support, defined as a work that focuses on supporting and equipping individuals for success. And I chose to represent these categories as interlocking puzzle pieces, because each piece requires a supporting part of the puzzle in order to create a whole healthy human. And while it might seem like a bit of a stretch for me to claim that four categories are largely responsible for wellness, there is an undeniable comparison here that can be made between these categories of outreach and Maslow's hierarchy of needs that many of us are familiar with. And on this slide here, you can see how I took the four categories of ministry related to food, community support, advocacy, and personal support, and aligned them with the needs of Maslow argues need to be met in order for an individual to be self-actualized or to be made well. And again, there's some overlap here. But in talking to people about my research, there was an interest expressed in learning specifically what churches are doing when it comes to outreach and social justice. I heard over and over again, I want to know what people are doing. So I don't have time to talk about everything that people are doing. Here is an outline. <laughs> um, yeah, so I do think it is important to highlight and lift up the work that is being done. And keep in mind, this is three congregations and 11 participants. And these are all ministries that these folks were engaged with directly. And again, I've stuck these categories into the four categories of food, community, advocacy, and personal support. With such a breadth of work being accomplished, the work of finding common themes seemed almost overwhelming. However, by careful coding and data analysis, several themes did emerge. And while I cannot cover all of these themes in this presentation, I will speak to three key themes the challenge of working in silos, burnout, and the power of small actions. All parties involved spoke about how siloed the work of social justice and outreach can be in a church, and how this isolation poses a significant challenge to the work they are about. In both Atwood Fellowship Church and Boyden Memorial Church, there was a collective frustration about the redundancy that can happen in church work because communication often breaks down. I know none of us here know anything about that. <laughs> As research participant Brandon says, we're all in silos here. We do our own work, we do good work, but we don't connect with each other. And communication for us as representatives of the congregation 
it's really important that the needs of our community as they're perceived are articulated back. We put those ideas on a board and see which are the ones that will get response and a leadership to move ahead. But we're just guessing right now. While the challenge of the siloed nature of outreach and social justice work was shared by all the participants of my research, Callahan Community Church identified this challenge and actively works against it to ensure that the work they're doing is interconnected and not siloed. As Catherine says, there's a lot of intersections between the social justice work that we do. It's not siloed. It's not like this is this event. It's all very connected and we talk to each other. I think we're good at not being single issue focused because that's not possible. And I just want to bookmark this here to come back to shortly. All churches identify the challenge of silos, but this one church took the step to work against silos. And this has particular bearing on the next major theme I want to identify, the theme of burnout. The collective consensus of those interviewed was that burnout is a real challenge, not just for the individuals engaged in the work, but also for the communities who are supporting the work. Research participants spoke about the challenge of retaining volunteers and cited the taxing nature of this work as one of the main reasons why volunteers are hard to solicit and maintain. For Atwood Fellowship Church and Boyden Memorial Church, the issue of burnout was more closely related to community burnout and not necessarily burnout of an individual. It's a creep, and it's a creep that you have to be aware of not to do, because I think it will lead to even more burnout within the church, even when you think it's not going to. And that was Anita at Atwood Fellowship Church. It's also tiring and draining. I think burnout is something to be concerned about for the congregation more generally, says Brandon. And while Atwood Fellowship Church and Boyden Memorial Church expressed a similar concern and experience of burnout that relates to the community more broadly, Callahan Community Church spoke of burnout in a different way. To them, the experience of burnout was more personal and individual. Burnout is something that's always something to be aware of. What's the expression? 20% 20 20 of people do 80% of the work in a congregation? I definitely feel that sometimes. There's more passion and potential possibilities than sometimes there's energy for. We're all just human. We have other things going on in our lives. How we balance and sustain ourselves is a concern. And if you recall a few moments ago, I asked you to bookmark how the churches interviewed talked about silos. It was interesting to me to notice that the two churches who spoke about being in silos and the challenges that creates for their work are the two churches who spoke about burnout in broader terms, that's burnout within the community. The church that worked to break down silos and integrate their work, Callahan Community Church, had a different concern about burnout as he spoke about burnout of the individual doing the work rather than the collective community. But because my research pool is limited and the parameters of this project confined, I can't really make a resolute statement about the relation between working in silos and burnout, but I do think it's something that is interesting to note and keep in mind as we think about what work we can do in our own church communities. The third major theme in my research that I want to bring to you today is the theme that a classmate Sarah will be going to pick, is going to pick up on shortly in her presentation. And that's the theme of small actions and deeds. One of my research participants reminded me of a story, and I'm sure many of us here have heard it. A child was walking along the beach where thousands of starfish had been washed ashore after a terrible storm. The child paused when she approached each starfish. She stooped low, tenderly picked up the vulnerable creature, and tossed it back into the ocean. The story goes that people watched with amusement and perhaps a bit of a laugh. After the child had been doing this for some time, she was approached by a man who asked her why she was doing this. Look at the beach, you can't save all these starfish, you can't begin to make a difference. The child boldly stooped down again, picked up another starfish, and while still in the presence of the man, she tossed it back into the ocean, just as she had done with so many others. She said, I just made all the difference for that one. Although I was familiar with this little story, I was glad that a research participant reminded me of it. The theme of small acts was woven throughout almost all of what my research participants had to share. 
One of my research questions asked participants to talk about their successes. And I intentionally left the word success undefined. But I will admit, I was expecting stories of extraordinary things. What I got, however, were stories like this from a participant who volunteers with the food bank. My favorite success is the man who is homeless who we finally got into an apartment. It took all of us working together for two years until he got that apartment. And for the first couple of weeks, when it was food bank, he'd walk by there and royally wave at us because he didn't need food. He was just so proud of himself that he could walk there. And that was Annika at Atwood Fellowship Church. And another story of how a small act made all the difference was also shared at Atwood Fellowship Church. One time there were some children hiding in the bushes. They were trying to get things from the community fridge. And we saw them. An old guy in a wheelchair chased them away and they threw a block of cheese so that he couldn't reach it. I went out and gave them one and I gave him one. But this family, this is how we were alerted to the need of this family. Now she, the mother, comes to volunteer here and they're happy here. They feel part of this community. The kids are going to school. They don't have to scavenge for food. I think that makes a big difference. And of course, these stories were not limited to Atwood Fellowship Church. A research participant of Boyden Memorial Church who helps lead a support group for parents of LGBTQ2S plus children and youth said, well, we've had many, many parents say that this group has been a lifeline for their journey and acceptance of their children's journey. The simple act of listening goes a long way. And my friends, I so wish I had the time to share with you all the stories of success I was privileged to hear in my research, but unfortunately time just won't allow. And of course, as mentioned earlier, you're welcome to read my paper, <laughs> little plug there, <laughs> once that becomes available. The work of all these churches was extremely contextual. Each church took the time to listen to the needs of the communities in which they were situated. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be a one size fits all approach to doing this work. What works for one church may or may not work for another church. But all of this leads to a bigger question what are we going to do with this data? What does it mean? What does it matter? What are the ideas? Well, I can't help but think of the United Church and their recently release, released new vision and call statement, which conveniently comes with its own graphic. <laughs> Deep spirituality, bold discipleship, and daring justice. The vision in full reads, called by God as disciples of Jesus, the United Church of Canada seeks to be a bold, connected, evolving church of diverse, courageous, hope-filled communities united in deep spirituality, inspiring worship, and daring justice. And while there is much more research to be done and much more to learn, my hope is that we as church leaders in the United Church or otherwise, try to, as, as we try to live out this deep spirituality, bold discipleship, this daring justice, that will keep in mind the voices of my research participants. We cannot continue to work in silos, lest we face the consequences of burnout as a denomination. While the work of daring justice can seem overwhelming, where do we start? How can we make an impact? Who are the least of these in our communities? There's comfort in knowing the impact of small steps by helping one person find a house, by sharing a block of cheese, by lending a listening ear, if we are truly to be a church of deep spirituality, bold discipleship, and daring justice, what can we take from the experiences of these churches and their leaders for our own practices of ministry? What can we take from the outside in?